Thank you, uh, Rutt. I will uh, speak briefly about uh, Statkraft, uh, then some words on decarbonization as such, uh, before talking about uh, you know Statkraft's initiatives within uh, decarbonization and, and what we do. So for those of you that are not familiar with uh, Statkraft, uh, we are Europe's largest generator of renewables. Uh, and we are a leading international uh, developer of new renewable projects with a strong growth trajectory, investing more than 10 billion kroner every year in uh, renewable uh, generation only. Statkraft is 100% um, owned by the Norwegian state, and we have roughly 4,500 employees uh, across 17 countries. When it comes to Statkraft's own um, climate uh, ambitions. We are amongst the European uh, utilities of, uh, of a certain size with the lowest carbon intensity in our own operations. And we are committed to staying well within a, a carbon intensity trajectory that is consistent with one and a half degree warming. Like I said, all of our growth is in renewables and we have a target to achieve carbon neutrality in our operations by 2040. And we have committed to several improvement initiatives such as uh, the EV100 targeting 100% electric vehicles globally by 2030 in our operations. So a few words about decarbonization as such. A simple four-step uh, way of illustrating the decarbonization of a modern economy uh, can be uh, illustrated like the, what we see on the screen at the moment. The obvious first step is to start decarbonizing the power sector. Once that is well on its way, uh, the next natural step is to use that low emissions electricity to decarbonize other sectors uh, in the third step, and then eventually the sectors where uh, plain electrification is not uh, enough needs to kind of happen uh, at the end and will happen at the end. However, in reality, this is of course somewhat more complicated. Um, this picture is from the Norwegian so-called Klimakur uh, and is focused on the non-ETS sectors to be uh, clear about that. Um, we don't need to look at uh, all the details of the picture, but uh, as an illustration, I find it to be quite good. From left to right in this image, we have least expensive to most expensive decarbonization measures, and the colors represent uh, different sectors or subsectors, depending on how you want to define it. And the point of including it here is to see that, you know, if you look at the colors, almost all sectors have both cheap, so to the left, and expensive to the right measures. Although, of course, not evenly uh, distributed uh, across the sectors, etc., it is still an interesting uh, aspect of decarbonization that, that even within relatively small subsectors, there are things that are really cheap to do and things that are expensive and difficult to do. So, if you want to talk about deep decarbonization, you need to kind of address. Uh, all of these things and, and uh, need to develop uh, solutions also for the most complicated or most expensive uh, measures that, that needs to be taken. So when we do our analysis of the total European energy supply, uh, you know, cutting across all the sectors, we see that decarbonizing the power sector to a large degree is, is relatively low cost. A lot of it simply happens because it is the cheapest way to supply uh, Europe with electricity. What we see on, on this page are the three energy use sectors, so transport, buildings and industry, and how they uh, are decarbonized in a cost optimal way uh, in our analysis. This is then uh, towards 2050. It is easy to see from this picture that direct electrification is the dominant measure but also that hydrogen plays an important part uh, with more traditional energy efficiency in, in the third place. So on to what Statkraft is doing about all of this. Well, as I've said already, 
all our investments go into renewable energy. Uh, and the vast majority of those investments go into developing, constructing, uh, and to a certain degree, upgrading renewable power plants in hydro, in wind, and in solar. Statkraft operates uh, in Europe, in Brazil, Peru, Chile, and India. And we have growth ambitions in, in all of these uh, regions. In addition, we invest in some facilities like uh, batteries and stabilizers, which are important contributors to, uh, uh, to building a power system uh, that can cope with high or very high uh, renewable shares. And as I said, in our analysis, we see that uh, the power sector can get to, to very high renewables shares, uh, relatively uh, cost efficient. You don't need uh, to spend a lot of subsidies to, to develop that. You simply need time to, to pass a bit. You know, this is a, a very large transition that we are uh, going through. There are clearly solutions that need to be developed. Uh, like I just mentioned, uh, um, things like batteries or stabilizers to, pro to provide inertia, etc., into the power system. In the next few slides, I will uh, mention some of the other businesses we develop in order to, to drive decarbonization in other sectors. Um, because I think, as I've said, uh, those sectors are maybe more uh, complicated to, to decarbonize and are in a way more in line with the, the theme of the day, uh, i.e. Uh, deep decarbonization. So almost in order of uh, slightly more complicated to even more complicated, the first thing to mention is that Statkraft uh, has a, an EV charging company that has been uh, rebranded to MER. And um, this is built on what some Norwegians may know as uh, Grøn Kontakt, that used to be called before, uh, before we rebranded it. Uh, and that has been uh, around developing its business in Norway for many years. And as you all know, Norway is the market in the world with the highest share of electric vehicles. So, of course, having uh, a kind of top two position in Norway is very interesting in terms of, of developing uh, a profitable business around uh, EVs and EV charging specifically. In addition, we have uh, recently entered into a, a JV in Sweden um, with what uh, with a company that used to be called B, which will be uh, rebranded then to, to also to Mer, uh, which is basically a top three charging company in Sweden, depending a bit on, on which of the segments within charging you look at. They are leading in one, some segments and, and uh, further down in other segments. In addition to that, we have uh, acquired a, a couple of companies in Germany, actually, and uh, uh, in the kind of on-the-go on uh, segment, we have uh, a top five position and, and, and a growing position. And we have uh, a small but growing activity in the UK as well. Decarbonization of the transport sector is uh, moving fast and will, as we saw earlier, be dominated by electric vehicles. On a global level, roughly half of all transport emissions are caused by so-called light-duty vehicles, so passenger vehicles, delivery vans, pickups, etc., which are all very well suited for electrification. Our analysis also shows, as we've seen, that there will be a large need for hydrogen for cases where direct electrification through vehicles, heat pumps or similar is not possible. And that hydrogen will probably come from many sources, but as a leading renewables company, it is natural that our focus uh, is on so-called green hydrogen, so hydrogen produced from electricity. The map shows the initiatives that we are involved in uh, within industry and heavy duty transport on land and sea. And these range from e-methanol in Finnfjord, green steel uh, in Moirana with Celsa, supplying the railways of Inlandsbanan in Sweden, uh, all the way to green ammonia at Herøya. 
And to go a bit deeper into the Harøya project, uh, this is a project that we are uh, investigating together with Yara and Akir. Uh, and one of the challenges of hydrogen uh, as such is to transport and store it since its energy density is very, very low. Um, and by converting it to ammonia, it becomes easier to transport and handle, uh, hence increasing its usability. And the obvious use, of course, is to replace ammonia, which today is produced with CO2 emissions. But ammonia is also very well suited as a shipping fuel and probably one of the most promising uh, solutions for shipping, which is one of the most challenging subsectors to decarbonize. The potential market for ammonia, should it become the fuel of choice for shipping is vast. It's hundreds of times larger than the potential plant at Harøya. So this uh, to us is an exciting project, which also can contribute to significant emissions reductions uh, in Norway. So to round it off, in many ways, uh, all of Statkraft's business activities contribute to uh, reducing emissions. And uh, it is our belief that renewables is not part of the solution. It is the solution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henrik, for that interesting uh, insight in Stuttgart's activities. And as you were pointing out at the end of your uh, presentation, uh, you were saying renewables is not part of the solution, it is the solution. And I know that Stuttgart's uh, slogan, at least in Norway, it is, it's uh, the future decides. And I was <clears throat> thinking when I was listening to your presentation about the former session that we had where Kiwan Riahi was um, giving us, mapping up uh, the, uh, the landscape for the COP26. And uh, he pointed out that um, in order to speed up the transition, particularly in, in, in many parts of the world, we will need granular, granular um, solutions. Uh, whereas uh, the lumpy ones, like big infrastructure and so on, might not necessarily slow things down, but it doesn't go that fast. And I mean, you're representing the lumpy side in many ways. How, how do you see this, um, you know, how do you see the speed of the transition going forward in order to decarbonize uh, the energy system? Hmm. I, th I think to me, one of the issues almost of the energy, energy transition is this, uh, need to kind of have a debate about whether your solution is better than my solution and we should only go for my solution and not your solution uh, because really we need everything yeah. uh, to work in parallel at the same time um, for this to for us to have any chance of reaching the kind of paris agreement uh, climate goals mm. uh, having said that i think um, for me we need uh, kind of structural uh, large-scale change in order to make this happen right in in 2020 uh, when we had the first uh, kind of um, wave of COVID in the developed world um, we saw uh, emissions reductions from basically shutting down the uh, many economies and large parts of the economy of you know uh, 15 20 25 percent which to me shows, you know, the answer is not to stop economic activity, then then we're not going to get there. We actually need uh, to replace the fossil energy with uh, fossil free alternatives then, mm. or emissions free alternatives. Yeah. And, and thanks a lot for pointing that out. And um, as you said, we need everything uh, that can uh, push us in the right direction. And there's a question from the audience. Do you collaborate with other similar partners, state or privately owned companies globally to influence and transfer your experiences and competences? Yeah, I think Startcraft works with a lot of different partners uh, across the world. Uh, in, in most of the countries we are present in, we have some form of collaboration with others. One of the more, let's say we talked about structural things, one of the more structural things we do is, is to uh, utilize our market competence and offer that to other renewable producers. So we market roughly double the amount of, uh, of generation we have ourselves. So more than 20 gigawatts of renewable generation is uh, kind of delivered to the market by Statkraft from other producers, mm. uh, as an example. 
Uh, there's another question as well from the audience. Um, solar and wind has a waste problem uh, that was mentioned in, in, the, in the former session as well and are also negative actors in land use. How do we go about this um, on the one side, the, the, um, uh, the pollution side of it and then also the nature conservation needs that we have at the same time? Um, how, how, how are you addressing that at Stadtkraft? No, so, um, you know, uh, addressing the uh, impacts on uh, nature is uh, extremely important uh, for us in our business and has been so for, you know, the, the more than 100 years we've been uh, operating in Stadkraft, uh, being coming from the hydropower side, which also has a significant nature impact. I think it is important to really... Um, acknowledge that uh, renewable generation as all other forms of infrastructure, all other forms of power generation has impacts on the nature around us. And um, while working to kind of minimize that impact, working with uh, ensuring that, uh, you know, circular perspectives are taken into account, also noting that uh, what we replace is uh, quite often worse, right? So, um, uh, the, the pollution impact of uh, coal-fired generation is, of course, much, much worse than, than the pollution impacts of renewable energy. Yeah, that's a fair point. In all kind of life cycle assessments, uh, renewable energy comes out uh, as the best option if you want uh, electricity. Yeah. Henrik, that is all we had time for so far, but you're going to join us again for the panel discussion. So I'll just say thank you and just stay put for, uh, for some more time and we'll see you again quite soon. Thank you so much.